Good morning, everyone. Glad we all could make it out this morning. We are going to be in Mark chapter 6, as Chris just said. Mark chapter 6, we're going to be beginning in verse 30. While you're turning there, just a couple, uh, just a couple things to um, add to what Chris said. If you're interested in being baptized um, on September 18th, um, I would encourage you to see myself or one of the elders, um, Gerald or Tim. Um, they're the two guys in the sound booth in the back. And... Um, uh, so we can talk to you, and again, as Chris said, if you're not, if you've already been baptized, or maybe not planning on it, you're, the Lord's still, uh, you're still wrestling with it. I would encourage you to come out, anyways, because baptism is something that's supposed to be done um, in public with others. It's a declaration of what the Lord's done internally in our lives, and so we get to do that. Um, externally, and it's supposed to be amongst others and other believers, and so. Um, you know, the more the merrier to cheer them on, you know, and it always, always uh, attracts a crowd at the beach anyways. You know, there's some guys trying to drown some people and everyone cheers and they're like, what's going on? And then uh, they start asking questions and you're like, well, no, we're not drowning them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, it's always a great time also to just be that light and that witness out there. And so, um, again, I encourage you to, to do that. Well, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning, bringing us all here together, and just, uh, Lord, for your spirit being with us, Lord. You said that where two or more gathered, you are there amongst them. And so we know that there's more than two of us here, Lord, and uh, you are dwelling amongst us, and you desire to speak to us this morning through your word. You've given us your word as a guide, as a tool as the thing which convicts us, encourages us, exhorts us. And so, Lord, whatever you have for us this morning, I pray we would not be distracted by the things around us or the things going on inside of us, and we would be able to listen to what your word has to say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And Jesus said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them, to, commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men." Now, if you go on to social media today or you see the latest and greatest books out there for Christians, you'll see that there are people pushing this narrative of a certain person God wants to use and God desires to use. You know, if you're a guy, it's, it's that manly man who's, you know, not just reading his Bible, but he's also chopping down trees and running through the forest and screaming at the top of his lungs on a mountain, beating his chest. If you're a woman, it's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ones for that. You know, maybe it's your, your, your stay-at-home mom only, and, you know, you have this perfect life and this perfect example and your perfect wife and all these different things and perfect kids and everything's perfect. And that's the kind of per- woman that God wants to use. It's no wonder our people in nowadays suffer with so much anxiety and stress for not living up to what they think they should. 
It's actually always been interesting to me, especially in my own life, as my own walk with the Lord, as we try and hide our weaknesses and who we truly are to the one who created us. We tend to think that somehow we can fake it until we make it with the Lord. It's kind of easy to do that with people. But we even do the same thing with our, with our Savior. We think that the Lord only wants strong men like David who is slaying giants to be used by Him, to be His disciple. But the truth is, God knows exactly who we are and He knows exactly how weak we are and yet He still desires to love us, to use us, to save us. And we're going to see that actually here this morning as we look at Jesus and this miracle of feeding 5,000 people, 5,000 men, probably about 10,000 people. Going back to the beginning in verse 30, it says, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Mark focuses on one main thing in Jesus. Every Gospel kind of has its own focal point or view of how they view Jesus or how they're trying to portray Jesus. All real and all valid and all obviously biblical since it is the Bible. But one thing Mark does a great job of doing is showing us the humanity of Jesus, right? We know that Jesus is God, but sometimes we can forget that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He wasn't 50% God, 50% man. He wasn't 80% God, 20% man, just when he had to eat. He was 100% God and 100% man. Now, the um, theological term for that, for the people with big heads, is hypostatic union. I remember when I first learned that. I just, I'm like, man, I can't wait to drop that in a sentence. <laughs> like that, People will just think I am so smart. The hypostatic union. You know, oh yeah, what about the hypostatic union? What do you think about that? You know, and he's 100% God and 100% man. And Mark does a great job of, a lot of times, showing off his humanity. And here, he is with his disciples, and they are telling him all that they did when he sent them out. You know, before um, he sent, in the last chapter, or the ending, sorry, in this chapter, he sent out the twelve to go, to go and to heal, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel, And then we kind of have a break because we have the story about John the Baptist and his death. And now we're coming back to uh, our timeline and the apostles get to Jesus as they go out into the country and they're telling them all the things that they did, you know, all the healings, all the demons cast out, which towns rejected them, which towns accepted them. And he says to them in verse 31, come aside by yourselves to his deserted place and rest a while. And Mark tells us that they couldn't even, there were just so many people around them, they couldn't even eat. Now see, our Lord, again, Mark showing the humanity of Jesus, our Lord is an example to us of how we should live. Right? As Christians, the term Christians, which was actually first used as a derogatory term in the first century, meant little Christs, people who were just little Christs, walking around trying to act like Christ. You know, if if you have kids, if you've seen my oldest, you know he's a (laughs) mini-me. And I I can tell you, he he tries, if I'm into it, he's into it. If I do it, he does it. Obviously, he has his, his different things, you know. He likes pickles. I can't stand pickles. Um, I'm, I'm reminded, okay, he, he's a mix of me and my wife. He's not just a spitting image. But he tries to do, you know, tries to be just like me. And for Christians, it should be the same way. We should try to be just like Christ. When we're saved, we're not just given a golden ticket to heaven. We're when we die, and then, hey, good luck the rest of your life. We'll see you in heaven. We're brought from death to life, and then 
from that point on, we're constantly being made, as the New Testament tells us, made into the image of Christ. God is working on us. Paul says in Ephesians, we're actually his, his poema, his poem, his work of art that he's molding and shaping into look like something, actually someone, Jesus Christ. And so when we read the Gospels and we see the things that Jesus does, probably apart from dying on the cross for the sins of the world, I, I wouldn't, you know, that's not gonna be any of us. He's done that once and for all. But we can see how he's an example for us. And even in the midst of his ministry, in the ministry of his disciples, he sees the importance of rest. His disciples have just come back from a short-term missions trip. And he tells them, let's take some time to rest. It's been rough. They've constantly, as we've been reading this gospel, you've seen they've constantly been trying to get away from the multitudes, not because they don't want to be around them, but just because they want to breathe for a second. They want to eat for a second. And Jesus says, let's take some time to rest. Even from the beginning, God has instilled in his people the importance of rest. And in our culture, busyness is a virtue. <laughs> right? we, we go around, we brag about how busy we are. Hey, what'd you do this week? Oh, let me tell you. And then you tell them, like, oh, you thought you were busy. Let me tell you. We had two baseball games on Saturday. And then we had to do walk the dogs, wash the car, mow the grass. Oh, that's what you And then someone walks up, oh, that's all you did? And then it's like who was the busiest and didn't get any sleep and had no social life and didn't get to spend time with the Lord and couldn't make it to church, couldn't do this and couldn't do that. Apparently that's the guy on the top of the food chain in our culture, the hustle culture. But our Lord shows us here that rest is important and it's needed and so he encourages his disciples, just like he even today, he encourages us to take time to rest. And in verse 33, but the multitudes saw them departing and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now, unfortunately, even though Jesus de desired rest for him and his disciples, it doesn't always work out that way. You know, one thing I love to do is take a nap on a Sunday afternoon. Now, in reality, I probably get one a month with a wife and four kids and just other things going on. It's the, the opportunity doesn't always present itself to take a nap. I probably won't get one today either, and I'm okay with that. I came to terms with that this morning when I woke up. <laughs> But unfortunately for his disciples, they couldn't get away. The people could see where they were going. And so they go, they basically go to cut them off. Oh, they're going to that side. Let's cut them off. Let's meet them there. You know, you can only imagine they're going to the other side of the sea. They get to the shore and there's this multitude. Hey, Jesus, how's it going? We found you. You love playing hide and seek, don't you? But notice Jesus' response to this. He doesn't say, hey, come on. Come on, guys, give me some rest, my disciples. He could have. He doesn't push them away, but he actually looks at them. He sees them. And most importantly, what Mark describes here, he sees their condition. Here we have a great picture of how the Lord sees us and understands us, quite frankly, even better than we know ourselves. He looked on them, Mark tells us, and he was moved with compassion in verse 30, 34 for them. He had pity on them. He saw their condition and it moved his heart. But what was their condition? Mark says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now for the unaware, which in our culture, might be a lot of us. Sheep not having a shepherd is a big deal. Sheep need a shepherd to survive. A shepherd is the one who would provide for them. He would go and he'd find the best pastures for his flocks. And he would lead them there to feed. He would find pure sources of water so that his sheep could drink. 
Or he'd go and bring his sheep to a well and, and bring the water from the well and let his sheep drink and water his sheep. A shepherd was also the one who protected his sheep. Sheep are not animals that are known for their fierceness or their violence. You don't ever see on National Geographic sheep hunting their prey. And so any threats that would come upon the sheep would be confronted by the shepherd and the shepherd would protect the sheep. We see a great picture of this in, with the life of David. Right, David talks about when he was a shepherd for his father's flock, he fought off bears and lions and, and wolves all to protect the sheep. And the sheep are just sitting there eating. Bah, you know, They don't know what's going on. Maybe they're a little, they're a little scared, but they don't worry because their shepherd is there. Their shepherd is protecting them. Their shepherd is keeping watch over the flock. In fact, that's where we found David when Samuel went to his father Jesse's house looking for the next king and went, saw all of his older brothers and the Lord says, none of these guys. And where was David? He was tending his father's flock. Not only that, but shepherds know their sheep, and the sheep know their shepherd. It's and even in today in um, countries where they have a lot of sheep and pastures. It's not uncommon to have more than one flock together. You know, this shepherd and that shepherd. They're kind of grazing on the same land. Maybe they're family members, friends, whatever. But when it's time to go, all the shepherd needs to do is they might have a whistle they do. They might have a command they say. And what's interesting is you'll have this mixture of sheep. And when their shepherd says, hey, let's go, only his sheep will move and follow after him because the sheep know his, their shepherd's voice. That's not just something Jesus said in John 10 to make us feel better about ourselves, that the sheep know their shepherd's voice. That's something that the creator of sheep knows about sheep. That sheep know the shepherd's voice. And not only that, but shepherds lead their sheep. Sheep aren't like cattle where you have to prod them and get them to move. If you've ever seen a western film and they're wrangling cattle, you know, they're all on their horses and they got their lassos and the cows are just going every way and they have to have the dogs and the, and the horses to kind of keep them in line. How a shepherd leads his sheep is he literally just walks in front and all the sheep follow him. The shepherd's the first one to face any obstacle or danger as they're leading the sheep through the, whatever territory they're going through. And what Jesus sees with these people is they're sheep without a shepherd. So now knowing all we do about sheep, the relationship of sheep and shepherds, we should see that their condition is very ill. Quite frankly, this is exactly how Jesus saw us before we knew him. We were sheep without a shepherd. We had no one to provide for us. We had no one protecting us. We had no one leading us. We had no one caring for us. And he has compassion on those people. And he has compassion even today on those that are lost. I think, if, again, we want to be like Christ, right? I, I would hope. That's why we're here this morning, to be more like Christ. Well, then we should see people the same way that Jesus does. And it's a big deal for our culture today. I mean, you see it today. Quote, unquote, the culture wars. Certainly, there's things going on in our country that 10, 20 years ago, we never thought would be happening. But as Paul tells us in Ephesians, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Our enemy is not people. The moment we start viewing our enemy as people or a people group or a certain people who think a certain way, we view them as our enemy, well, we've lost the heart of Jesus. We start viewing them like Jesus does as sheep without a shepherd, people that are lost. And, and when you hear people speak, talk, who don't know Jesus, and you really listen, you can see they're lost. 
All of us before Christ know this. We were the same way. We were lost. In fact, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus speaks on the love the Father has and uses the parable of a shepherd and his lost sheep. He has 100 sheep. One goes astray. What does he do? Well, at least he's still got 99. No, he goes after the one because he loves that sheep. When he sees a lost sheep, he goes after them. He loves them. He has, as we see here, compassion on them. And what did he do when he sees their condition and their state? The first thing he does is he feeds them spiritually. He teaches them. He says he taught them many things in verse 34. The Lord is all about teaching us. Because it's through his word that we grow as his people. Not through good works. Not through coming to church. Not through tithing. Not through even evangelism. We grow through his word. And it continues, verse 35. When the day was now far spent. So he's been out there a while teaching them. They came to his disciples like, we were supposed to rest. (laughs) Here we are. Days far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, it's out in the middle of nowhere, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So now Jesus is feeding the people spiritually, but they also have human needs. And Jesus doesn't ignore the human needs. They are needing to eat. But the problem is they're in the middle of a desert. And there's a lot of people. And you know they didn't bring enough food to feed everyone. And they even kind of make reference there in verse 37. And he says, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? A lot of people think that's what they had in their bag, their money bag. We're told throughout the Gospels that they kind of collect or had a community money bag that Judas was in charge of. And so he's thinking, well, hey, I mean, we could go out and buy food, but they even seem to doubt that that would work. John's Gospel tells us that this was also during Passover, So it was an important time, lots of feasts going on. And then in the end of verse 38, we see that when Jesus tells them, let's see how much food we do have, they find out it's five loaves and two fish. And John's gospel tells us it was actually provided by a young boy. So it wasn't even their own food that they had. It wasn't the community's food that they had. There's one guy, one little boy says, well, I got five loaves of bread and two fish. Um, But there's 5,000 men which would equate to about probably 10,000 people. But Jesus doesn't seem to be too worried about this, and we'll see why here, verse 39. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. So Jesus here kind of takes command, as he kind of always does. He he doesn't let his disciples run the show for good reason. Because they'd all be arguing who'd be in charge. Jesus takes command and tells them all to sit down. They sit down in ranks of hundreds and fifties. And now he's ready to feed them. Jesus knew their humanity. Jesus knew that these people needed to be fed. And he doesn't say, well, yeah, let them go out into the other places and eat. Let them figure it out. But Jesus really desired not just to feed these people spiritually, but to feed them physically. Because Jesus, being 100% man, knows what it's like to be hungry. He desired to take care of them. 
Jesus knows our humanity. Jesus knows that we experience hunger and restlessness and pain and sorrow. In fact, Isaiah says he was a man of many sorrows. Jesus understands our humanity. He doesn't look down on it. I mean, he created us. <laughs> and we see here, he has them all sit down, and then as another example to us, he takes the bread and he blesses it. He thanks the Lord for it. Taking the time to give thanks for what the Lord has blessed us with should be on the forefront of every believer's mind. Now that doesn't mean that like if you don't pray for your food before you eat, you're, you know, ungrateful and a sinner. And I remember when I was going to Bible college, um, uh, you know, obviously a lot of holy people there. And uh, I wasn't one of them, apparently, because <laughs> I wouldn't always bow my head, close my eyes, fold my hands before I ate. And, you know, you'd be eating in a cafeteria with other students, and you'd start eating, and they would, they'd pray, and they'd look at, well, you never prayed. I'm like, uh, you're right, I, I didn't do what you just did, but I was still great. I'm still, I thank the Lord for what I have. Didn't make a show of it. But it's still to be on our minds to be thankful for all the, even, even the little that they had. He doesn't say, you know, Lord, could you really, I mean, this is all we got, really? Five loaves, two fish? No, he takes the five loaves and the two fish and he blesses it and he thanks the Lord for it. Even when you're in want, do you thank the Lord? Paul in Philippians tells the church in Philippi about how he has learned to be content with much and with little. Because he's learned that as long as he has the Lord, he is more than enough. He has more than he ever could imagine. And quite frankly, we see that he goes to the Lord and this is exactly why he was not worried about the resources that he had. He sees the lack of resources and he's not worried. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and we see that he was able to feed about 10,000 people. But he didn't just feed them. Notice what it says. They ate and they were filled. They ate and then they were filled. This wasn't just a little snack some hors d'oeuvres. You know, Jesus is passing out hors d'oeuvres to kind of, you know, keep you, you know, sometimes you'll invite people, you know, uh, I know we've done this with birthday parties um, for our kids, but we're like, all right, we're gonna invite people over at two so that way we don't have to feed them lunch or dinner. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> you know, because feeding a bunch of kids, like food, just if you give them a bunch of snacks, they'll eat that all day, every day. You know, get them at two and then at four, kick them out. Then, you know, their parents can figure out what they want to eat and stuff. And you got kids with food allergies and all these things. And, you know, you got to, you know, oh, we can't do this because so-and-so is this and that. And you're like, all right, whatever. So that's the, that's, write that. That's a note you can take. It's not a biblical note, but you can still take that one down. Five people over at two. You don't have to feed them lunch or dinner. Or at eight. And they already ate dinner. And you could just maybe give them some desserts, you know, something like that. You're still being hospitable. Don't worry. But it says here they, were, they ate and they were filled. They were full. They were stuffed. Five loaves and two fish, 10,000 people. They were filled. This is such an amazing miracle when you really think about it. And it was amazing and is amazing. So much so that all four gospels mention it. And if you've read all four Gospels, you notice there's a lot of differences. A lot of stories aren't mentioned, most stories aren't mentioned in all four Gospels. There are very few stories that are mentioned in all four Gospels. But this here is actually one of them. Jesus feeding the 5,000. We know that later on he actually feeds 4,000. Again, this is men. When it says 5,000, it speaks of 5,000 men because in that culture, you didn't count women and children. It was just men. Later on, he'll feed 4,000 men, so probably about 8,000 total. 
And it's crazy because even then his disciples are freaking out, like, what are we going to do? And she's like, I don't know, we just fed 10,000. You think this is going to be okay? <laughs> A lot of times I think this, this miracle really shows us what we bring to the table with the Lord. There's a need, and we have very little to offer, very little to offer. But the Lord calls us to trust him, and we see that he always meets the need regardless of what we have to offer. You know, Lord, I'm just not good enough for that. You know, Lord, I don't have the talent for that. Lord, I don't have the courage for that. Lord, I don't have the money for that. I don't have the resources for that. You know, just speaking about hospitality. You know, oh Lord, you know, our, our house, it's, you know, it's not, not that big. I don't really want to invite people over. I don't have a lot. The Lord tells us and commands us as believers to be hospitable. The provision of the Lord, as we see here, is always filling, and then as we see after that, it's more than enough because what happens after? It's just, it's completely gone, right? Five loaves, two fish, and everyone ate and were filled and there's nothing left? No. The disciples learned a very valuable lesson here. There are 12 baskets full of leftovers, which again, is just amazing. The 12 basketfuls of leftovers were probably more than the five loaves and the two fish put together. And yet 10,000 people ate and were filled and now there's 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And actually, the Greek word described for basket here is actually more of like a, a carrying bag that they would have carried on a journey. You know, kind of like a little lunchbox, if you will. If you remember earlier on in the chapter when Jesus sends out his disciples, what does he tell them? He tells them not to bring a lunchbox not to bring any food with them. And now we see as the disciples kind of doubted the Lord a little bit, you know, 10,000 people, how are we gonna feed them? Lord, you're in the middle of nowhere, you're crazy, five loaves, two fish. You know, you can heal, you can walk on water, you can do all these things, but I, I just don't see how you can multiply food. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, if, if you only have six burgers, you only have six burgers. If seven people come, I'm sorry, they're vegan that day. But Jesus is able to multiply, and not just multiply to enough, but more than enough. He always provides for his people. And I'm sure as the disciples are all collecting the leftovers, they each have a, a, a basket in their hand, and they're saying, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Jesus knew exactly what he was working with. He knew exactly the resources he had. He knew exactly the condition of the people. He saw they were hungry. He didn't just say, well, the spiritual food will be enough. He was like, oh, these guys need to eat. Yeah, let's feed them. He sees the people as they're coming, and instead of saying, I need rest, he says, these are sheep, these are sheep without a shepherd. Let me shepherd them. Jesus Christ coming down to be human like one of us is not just a great story or a belief we have, but also throughout the Gospels we see that he suffered like us, he lived like us, he had sorrow like us, he cried like us, he hungered like us, he was with want like we are with want and need. In fact, in Hebrews, we're told that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted at all points like we were, yet without sin. That temptation, that struggle, that desire that you just can't shake, Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows exactly what kind of resources he has in us. There's no reason to put up a front. There's no reason to try and fake it till you make it. There's no reason to try and hide your true self from Jesus. He already knows, so. It's, it's ever like playing hide and seek with a three-year-old. I mean, you know where they are. 
you know, a minute into looking for them, they're already yelling, did you find me yet? You know, like, well, and now I did. But we do this so often, don't we? We try and hide our true selves from Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I'm having such a great day. Thank you for a great day. And Jesus is like, yeah, you, you had a horrible day, I know. I know you're struggling with that. Why won't you come to me with that? Are you afraid that I'll look, look on you any different? He knows what we are lacking. He knows what we are struggling with. He knows what we want, what we desire, what we need. And he does not worry about that. He doesn't say, well, you know, you're not David slaying Goliath. You know, when David slayed Goliath, he was a weak man. But he trusted in the Lord. He doesn't say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a great man of combat, so pff, taking down Goliath will be easy. I've trained my whole life for this moment. No, he says, look, every time I've been out with my father's flock, I was able to fight off lions and bears and wolves, all because the Lord gave me the strength. And who is this guy who's blaspheming the Lord? I mean, pff, he can't be better than a bear. And if the Lord give me the strength to take out those, that bear, well, give me the strength to take out Goliath. He never trusted in himself. He doesn't worry about us. He doesn't see our weakness and say, well, I really want to use them, but they're just so weak. Paul had to learn this lesson the hard way, like most of us learn it. Paul used to think the same way, that you know, he, he was puffed up by everything he was. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew all the things, kept all the laws, did all the right stuff. And yet, he had a thorn in the flesh that kept him weak, that kept him from being prideful. And in 2 Corinthians, he tells the Corinthians who were prideful, boasting in and of themselves, he says that the Lord is made strong not through our strengths like we so often think. He's made strong through our weaknesses. That's where he is made strong. He's made strong because quite frankly we're all five loaves and two fish trying to feed 10,000 people. And the Lord knows that and he's not worried about that and he's gonna bless it. He's gonna bless your life if you allow him. The young lad was willing to give up the five loaves and two fish, right? And he could have said, yeah, it's not gonna work. I'm just, me and my family will eat this and everyone else can figure out what they're gonna do. And you have to be willing to give up those five loaves and two fish and saying, you know what? I'm gonna just give it to the Lord and let him bless it. Let him see what he's gonna do with my life. See, Jesus sees us as we are, he knows us as we are, and he desires to shepherd us as we need. He looks on us and he has compassion. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just that you see us, you know us, and you don't desire that we try and put on some sort of mask or facade to show that we're some true strong believers and that because we're such strong believers, you're using us. Lord, we're weak, all of us. All of us are lacking. None of us have the resources to do your work. And so, Lord, we rely on you and your spirit, on your word, on the other people around us. So, Lord, fill us with your spirit to do your work, knowing that of our flesh we can do nothing. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with us this week. Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you, they would see that you came down as a man, suffered more than we could ever suffer on that cross. You died and you rose again for them because you saw them and you loved them and you have compassion on them and you desired to shepherd them because they're lost. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.